Stagflation! The misery index is set to explode. And here is how you should invest for it. I'm going to explain it to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over inflation. And the last time we had stagflation back in the 70s. So I've got a chart going back to 1960. And on the left, it goes from 0% inflation all the way up to 15% inflation. So it starts off in 1960, pretty low, then starts to creep up around 1970, and then it starts to go back down in the early 70s, but then it shoots back up till we get to a peak in 1980 at almost 15% inflation. And keep in mind, that's 15% inflation that the government is willing to admit to. <laughs> so it was most likely a lot higher than that. Volcker comes in and destroys inflation by jacking interest rates almost up to 20%. It comes crashing down. 1985 bottoms out temporarily at about 5%. That's right when we had the Plaza Accord. I want to point out during this time, the dollar and in the international markets, especially relative to the yen in the Deutschmark, went down by 50%. But... Domestic inflation was only around five or six. So it goes up slightly to 1990, comes down, goes up a little bit before the dot-com bust, and then it peaks up in 2007 and then comes crashing down to a little less than zero. I want to point out here that although we had massive asset deflation, the consumer price index, and that's the way the government measures it, which is most likely lower than reality, barely got down below zero, although asset prices came crashing down by more than 50%. It goes back up 2010, comes right back down 2015, levels off to where we are today, supposedly based on the government numbers. I also want to point out that from 2008 to 2012, home prices, which is most people's main asset, went down in value steadily. It bottomed out in 2012, while at the same time, the CPI, the prices of goods and services you buy on a daily basis, went up. It's very, very important we understand that asset prices can go down while the cost of goods and services, the stuff you buy on a daily basis, goes up. So how does this apply to what's going on today? Moving up, we see my awesome map of the United States. Believe it or not, I drew that by myself. And we have your insolvent most likely your uncle, drunk, Sam, right here on the right. The Fed and the government is printing up funny money like there's no tomorrow. They're spending it into the economy, creating these deposits, most likely through MMT from the government. Of course, they're monetizing that debt because the Fed's buying it almost immediately to keep interest rates low. The Fed is also creating deposits now in the real economy because of all the four-letter and five-letter solutions that they have. They're creating deposits. They're not just creating extra reserves held at the Fed for the primary dealers. And we have our grand total population in the United States of five five people. The Fed and government between them, they create $6 of additional money that goes right into the pocket of these five people. But unfortunately, they don't have many options for food. They had the option of a cafe or a store, but the cafe is shut down due to the Cervasa sickness and might shut down permanently. More on that in step number two. So the only option is for them to take the $6 of MMT they received from either the Fed or the government and spend it at the store. So what happens if the supply decreases and the amount of money increases? Of course, price inflation. Unfortunately, it gets worse because we now have supply chain disruptions and we're going to have a massive push in the future, in my opinion, 
towards deglobalization. So how does that work? We've got low wage country XYZ currently, or as of 30 days ago, or before we had the Cerveza sickness, they would import stuff to us in the United States. And we would give them dollars for the stuff that they manufactured at a low price and sent to us. So our imports were stuff and our exports were these green pieces of paper called dollars, okay? Well, if the low-wage country is importing us less medical masks, pharmaceuticals, or if you just fill in the blank, and we're creating more of the stuff here, well, number one, prices immediately go up, even if we could create those domestic supply chains, because we don't have low-wage workers. We have high-wage workers. So the price of your inputs for all those goods and services immediately goes up, and that's if you could produce it in the United States. Additionally, we have more dollars staying in the United States circulating. Before, when we would export dollars, let's say we had an additional $6 in the system, well, two or three of those dollars would leave the United States and go to the low-wage country. So only $3 would be circulating in the U.S. But now we could face a scenario where all six of those dollars are circulating in the United States, creating more domestic consumer price inflation. Why? Because we're not exporting those dollars and we have a higher supply of money due to MMT and a lower supply of goods and services. And the rebuttal is, George, yes, but because people aren't taking out loans, then that decreases the dollars in the system. And you are absolutely right. You definitely watched my video <laughs> with Brent Johnson. But let's think this through. If we have a bank and their balance sheet has assets and liabilities. The liabilities are deposits, assets, loans. Well, if they have fewer loans, the money supply is decreasing. But what are they creating those loans to buy? Usually, it's something like a house or a car. So there would be fewer dollars created, but there's fewer dollars created, or the money supply is contracting for homes and cars, not necessarily food you buy at the grocery store. See where I'm going with this? So we have a setup where the stuff you buy on a daily basis, prices are going up, but the homes and cars and other assets, the prices are going down. I think it's very likely over the next year or two, we could see inflation that would be very consistent with what we saw in the 1970s. So above 6% going up to 10, maybe even 15%. Step number two. Now let's discuss unemployment. We've got a chart going all the way back to 1970, goes up to today. On the left-hand side, the unemployment rate goes from zero all the way up to 12%. We start at 1970, right around 5 or 6%. That goes up in 1970 to almost 10%. Comes down a little bit, but then skyrockets to over 12%, 1980, 82. Then it comes back down 1985, 1990. We're getting pretty good, but then it goes right back up to over 8% when we go through that mild recession of 1990. Gradually comes all the way down until we get to the dot com bust. We have another recession, goes up near 7, 8% comes down before the GFC, and then spikes all the way back up to 10 to 12%. Then comes all the way back down to where we are as of 30 days ago, where unemployment was at an all time low. Insert the Cerveza sickness. There's many analysts that believe the unemployment rate can go up to 30% if not higher. And if we look at the jobless claims yesterday at 3.3 million, it's not hard to understand 
how they're coming to those numbers. So if we have inflation at over 10%, which I think is very realistic on the goods and services you buy on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have unemployment at 30%, where does that put us on the misery index? Far higher than we were in the 1970s, the 1940s during World War II when we had the interest rate peg or the yield curve peg that they're suggesting we do now. And it's far worse than we had in the 1930s during the Great Depression. So let's go over some potential solutions. Well, one thing that's being talked about all the time is quarantining people who are most at risk. Okay, let's just say that you quarantined everyone over the age of 55. Editor, go ahead and throw up the chart. You can see that that would be about 60 or 65 million people. And I'd like to point out, those are the older people with the money. The young people don't have money to spend. So if one man's spending is another man's income, and I know that's kind of Keynesian, but to a certain degree, I think that's very true. It all starts on the supply side. I get it. But there is a demand component to this as well, especially when your economy is 70% consumption. So since we can all agree, no matter how optimistic you are about the Cervasa sickness, that the unemployment rate would skyrocket if 60 million people were quarantined in the United States, it still takes the unemployment rate at least as high as we had in the 1970s. Let's talk about services. Since that's such a large part of our economy, what happens when all the restaurants close? I've read headlines saying that 10 to 30% of the restaurants in the United States could go out of business permanently. And then what about travel? Most people understand that we won't get rid of the Cervasa sickness until we get to herd immunity. You can get there one of two ways, either through a vaccine or if you just allow 60 to 80% of the population to be infected and then build up the immunity required to keep it from spreading. Okay, well, what does that do to travel? Not just foreign travel, but also potentially even domestic travel. We see a huge outbreak in New York right now. So if this gets very serious, and if there's another state, we'll call it Wyoming, that doesn't have a lot of cases and they don't want to disrupt their economy, are they going to allow flights coming in from New York? Maybe. Maybe not. We'll have to wait and find out. But at the very least, you can see countries like Singapore and South Korea who have handled this problem very well. They have a very low case rate and their case fatality rate is also extremely low. Why? Because they tackled this very strongly right at the beginning. Although their cases have flatlined, now they've opened back up, flights are coming back in, and guess what's happening? The infection rate is going back up, not because people are spreading it from one Singaporean to the next Singaporean, but all the people coming in on planes are bringing it back in. You see, this is not a problem where you just wake up one day and it's solved. There's many, many variables here that we have to think through. So again, let's say the services industry is hit extremely hard at a minimum. Let's say travel is restricted on a moving forward basis until we come up with a vaccine, call it a year 18 months. That also increases unemployment substantially. And those are the most optimistic projections. If we go over to the left, you'll see I've tried to simplify this as much as possible. And I've done the math on this. And if anyone thinks there's a different option other than what I've outlined, they just simply haven't done the math. Option number one is to let this rip through the population as fast as we can to build up herd immunity. With this option, you're doing as little damage to the economy as possible. You're overweighting the economy. To be clear, I think there would still be significant damage done. There's no way 
of getting around that, but we're sacrificing the health of the general population. Now, let's put some numbers to it. Let's be as optimistic as we can and assume we only need to achieve 60% herd immunity. That would mean 198 million Americans need to be infected. Okay. Well, if there's a case fatality rate of 1%, that means 1.9 million Americans would die. Okay, well, that's not a very good option. Going to the other extreme, we overweight the health of our population. We're still going to have people die. We all know that. But then the economy suffers tremendously. This is a total lockdown a lot like they had in China. That takes us to an outcome where yes, we do save a lot of lives, but from an economic standpoint, we go into a 1930s style depression, but far, far worse. I would call it 1930s 10X at a very minimum. And I wanna be clear, just because we go through a 1930s type depression it doesn't mean we have to go through a deflationary depression. We could very well go through an inflationary depression, and I think that is most probable. Then we have what we'll most likely do, and that's something right in the middle. So we're not sacrificing health totally. We're not sacrificing the economy totally. It's a balancing act. But even there, we have a lot of fatalities and we have an unemployment rate that gets to the 1970s, if not higher. In my opinion, this is the most probable outcome. And for all those people out there that think we can go right back to business as usual, what you're not understanding is we have to build herd immunity. Let's just say that we've all been shacked up in our houses for two weeks and then we open the economy back up on Easter, everything back to normal. Well, you only have, let's say, 10% herd immunity. So uh, you're going to have another 50% of the population get it. At a 1% fatality rate, you can do the math. We need to understand that in the United States, if we want to have the same type of results as China, Japan, or South Korea, we need to take the same type of action. We can't expect to have good results without taking any action. That's unrealistic. The math doesn't work. So if we want the same results as call it Japan, well, we need to make sure that every single person, the second they walk out the door, is wearing an N95 mask. Also with China, if we want the same type of results, we'd have to go into total lockdown, just like they did. South Korea, if we want the same type of results, we've got to test 100% of the population, or as close to it as you can get. Again, to reiterate, we cannot expect the same types of results as a Japan, China, or South Korea if we don't take the same type of action. But I also want to point out the Japanese has seen their economy take a huge hit. Editor, throw up the chart of the Japanese PMI. This is the manufacturing index. This also includes services. It drops off a cliff. Same thing for China. So just because you're able to keep your economy going while at the same time getting the r naught value of the Cerveza sickness as low as possible, it doesn't mean that it won't still crush your economy. We go back to the middle examples and we see the most likely outcome is for us to curve this, try to keep it under the capacity of the hospital system. But in doing so, we don't have a choice. It's going to damage the economy. Therefore, unemployment is going to get extremely, extremely high. Step number three, what are my personal investment strategies right now? And to be clear, this isn't investment advice. 
just what I'm considering for my own portfolio. It starts with a process of elimination. I want to try to figure out what I don't want to buy. Let's check out a chart going back to 1995 all the way to 2020. The red line indicates growth stocks, blue line value stocks. This is relative to the S&P 500. So if the line's going up, it's outperforming. Line going down, underperforming. From 2005 to about, call it 30 days ago, <laughs> growth did very well. Value did extremely well. Poorly. So on a moving forward basis, if I believe the economy is going to struggle, I don't want to own anything that's expensive. So you can take growth right off the list. But to be clear, I don't like value either because I think the entire S&P is overvalued when you look at metrics like market cap to GDP or the CAPE ratio. Next, long bonds. Don't want anything to do with 10-year treasuries or 30-year treasuries. It's not to say the interest rates won't go down, the prices won't go up, but if we have a lot of inflation potential and the market perceives inflation coming down the pipeline, that's going to put a lot of upward pressure on the yields at the long end of the curve. And to be clear, the Fed could still take rates down to negative 50 basis points, 100 basis points, who knows? But just because they're taking interest rates lower, it doesn't mean that the interest rates on the long end of the yield curve will come down. We could really start to see it steepen. And yes, the Fed could come in and try to peg the yield curve by printing a lot more funny money. But when the peg breaks or when it's lifted, interest rates are really going to shoot higher. That means you're losing value in the form of purchasing power when you're getting paid back the dollars, or you're losing purchasing power in the form of the value of the bond you own actually going down. So where do I see opportunity? Well, to dive into this deeper, let's go to a clip of my full-length interview with former fund manager and Wall Street insider Chris McIntosh. He's great buddies with Brent Johnson and Raul Paul. Brilliant guy. You're going to love the clip and you're going to love tomorrow's full length interview. Editor, help me out. You know, you're saying, how do you, how, or how are we positioning it? Um, largely it's, it's, it's hard assets and it's value over growth. Okay. What I mean by value over growth is, you know, we're going to come out of this chaos when we when when we crawl out of the car wreckage, that's when balance sheets are going to matter. That's when solvency is going to matter. And when we climb out of that car wreckage, we're going to also be in an environment where there will be more wreckages because the impact that is going to take place and is already taking place in the economy by shutting down business, I don't quite think people fully understand how how dramatic that's going to be. If you take, um, I was just looking at a survey done here locally, 20, I think it was 27%, no, um, it was 60 percent of small SMEs have 27 days that they could last oh, with yeah. no income. Yeah. Okay, 27 days. We're currently on a lockdown for four weeks. Yeah. Now, to a certain extent, New Zealand doesn't matter. No people here. Forget about us. But <laughs> look at <laughs> look at this is taking place across Europe, across the U.S. The, you know, people are still focused on the here and now. Like, think about what that looks like in four weeks, six weeks, six months, mm -hmm. and the flow-on effect. You know, people are calling for a V-shaped recovery. I'm not sure they're looking at the numbers and, and, and thinking this through. The one thing I'm about 100% sure of is that this won't be a V-shaped recovery. Um, and in that environment, it's a massive contraction of productivity and supply of goods. Um, and ironically, if you go back, I mean, all the stuff that we've been looking at for the last few you know years have been these decimated sectors whereby... There's no cap, 
little capital investments into them. Um, valuations are extremely cheap, and now they just got cheaper, but they're also critical to, to society. So we like real assets, and I consider this the basics, like food, energy, and shelter. Notice I said shelter. I didn't say real estate. Why? Because right now I'm actually seeing them as two completely separate asset classes. Shelter would be just the basics you need to survive. So a roof over your head. Anything in addition to that, so a big, huge backyard, five acres, a 5,000 square foot house in a super fancy neighborhood or a penthouse loft in New York that's $5 million, that's in excess of just basic shelter. <laughs> so I'm very bearish on real estate, but on shelter, not necessarily bullish, but I don't think you're going to lose money in that asset class if we go into this environment of a poor economy with stagflation. Obviously, I like gold and silver, but to be clear, gold insurance, silver potential speculation. Also like the asymmetry in Bitcoin, but I've got another asterisk there. So I'm very clear that Bitcoin, in my opinion, is not digital gold. It's not insurance, but it could be a very interesting speculation. And Chris and I go over all of this in our full length interview tomorrow. So make sure you're tuning in. You don't want to miss a thing. And I know most of you right now are saying, wait, whoa, whoa, time out, George. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You can't tell me all these concepts and ideas without giving me a specific example, something that I can look into, something actionable that I can research before tomorrow's interview with Chris. Well, I don't want to completely let the cat out of the bag, but what I will tell you is tomorrow we discuss an ETF that's in one of the industries right here on the dry erase board where the underlying assets have very little debt and it pays a 13% dividend yield. So make sure, make sure you set your alarm and check out the full interview with Chris tomorrow. You're absolutely going to love it. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. <laughs> and I will see you on the next video.